not just adopting but embracing technology. The financial services sector has had a complete facelift in terms of who they reach, what they offer, and how they reach their audience with technology being a really strong accelerator. We now talk to Sanjeev Bajaj, the Chairman and Managing Director of Bajaj Finserve, on how he's seen the industry transform with technology-led innovation all across the value chain. Uh, just wanted to ask you, first of all, in the last two years, we've seen a large number of companies really transform in how they're working. Now, with the lockdowns in place, with COVID taking place, many institutions have been forced to change the way in which that they are serving their customers and have had to innovate really, really fast on that. Now, many of us used to be used to the old ways of doing things before COVID, but now it seems to be a new normal is coming. So how, to your mind, has the financial services industry really accelerated this entire digital transformation? As you clearly said, the last year and a half, two years, has uh, provided significant impetus for change. And if you look at financial services, look at banking, insurance, other allied financial products and solutions, if you think about it, for the past century, the delivery hasn't really changed much to the customers. For decades, people walked into branches of banks or insurance companies, did their business there. Maybe they went to the ATM thereafter. But life remained, by and large, very similar. Partly this is also because these are very strongly regulated businesses, um, understandably, because they handle people's money. But strong regulation very often also impedes innovation. We have seen the last uh, year and a half of this pandemic, and if I were to go a little prior to that, just with the disintermediation that you're seeing in financial services driven by fintechs, insurtech companies, we're seeing this industry unraveling in how it accesses the customer. And a number of interesting models are evolving. Many of these that we ourselves experience now really aid in accessing customers. So whether it's for payments, whether it is for simple insurance products, simple loan products. So at the front end, what customers see is a far more intuitive digital interface um, in accessing these products. And you don't have to go to the branch uh, anymore for them. But this is backed then with efficient digital delivery. It is backed by very strong processes around how you access data and what you do with that. And all the while keeping in mind that you have to align with regulation as well. So we, have, we are seeing a significant adoption across dif different aspects of the digital world, uh, even in financial services. Again, as I said, because we are a very heavily regulated industry, you will not see as much of disruption as you see in many other sectors, whether it's retail, whether it's travel, uh, we have seen hospitality. But surely and steadily, we are seeing this change. And institutions, especially the uh, incumbents, will need to adopt digital as a way of life, whether it's in customer-facing activities, seamless delivery, of products and services, managing things like risk, managing underwriting, managing claims and collections. All this is undergoing a sea change as we talk. So there is significant amount of change that is happening, but in a regulated context, you have to always keep that in mind. And we can see the last year and a half has dramatically increased adoption across various customer segments and not just income segments, Vikram, but even across ages. Look at our parents, look at grandparents, the ease with which they're ordering food, the ease with which they're ordering stuff uh, online for their homes, groceries. Uh, all this has happened in this pandemic uh, period. What this will also mean is huge amount of volume, volume swings because there's competition as well that will happen across these different entities or platforms, you can call them. And that's why the requirement of very solid, stable, and scalable cloud infrastructure becomes a prerequisite as well. So I would say all in all, you're seeing a dramatic change taking place in financial services, and this is only the start of it. So just looking at a couple of the trends that you spoke about, first of all, yes, it's true that people are connected now 24-7 digitally, they're connected. You've got many nimble startups coming up and you know providing niche products, they're providing niche services. 
So, um, you know, and customers obviously have got a greater choice right now. So, a couple of things. What is the shift in which, uh, by which incumbents will try and accelerate their innovation to both retain their customer base and also reach out to newer customers? And also, how does that, the, the, the market for financial services get broad-based, particularly, for example, targeting younger people who may now be looking at some of those financial services and looking at it digitally? Again, a very interesting and relevant question. And as you know, there isn't one answer uh, for all. So let me first start off just talking about ourselves, uh, whether it's at Bajaj FinServ or Bajaj Allianz, our uh, two insurance companies. Uh, our adoption of the digital world and uh, uh, our adoption of data and how we use data for cross-sell, uh, our adoption of cloud as our basic infrastructure for building new solutions for the customer. This started uh, much before the pandemic because we saw this change happening and in many ways we are leading some of the initiatives in this area. Now, before you talk of incumbents, what we must look at is what is the strength that these new startups are bringing to the table, whether they are fintechs, uh, insurtechs, they end up offering niche products and services. They are not trying to do everything and they don't have the bandwidth to do that um, as distinct from say a bank or an NBFC or an insurance company. But they become very good at offering a finite set of products and services to customers in a very intuitive, digital manner and providing, providing them with much greater choice in their buying decisions. So they are able to really access customers and the front end relationship in far better ways, if I would dare to say, uh, dare to say so, than the incumbents. On the other hand, when you look at traditional banks, look at insurance companies, they are much better positioned to provide stability. For example, in the way they manage risk, in the way they manage assets and liabilities, in the way they manage their treasuries, they actually generate profits, which a lot of the startups don't generate. So there are some very significant strengths that uh, incumbents bring in. But what they have to do is they have to learn now to get closer and smarter to the customer in this digital age. They have to get past uh, the legacy systems for much more nimble innovation and execution. They have to find to work with regulators evolve regulation as is relevant for the future. They also have to, uh, have to keep in mind that most of them are listed entities. Listed entities have a responsibility to report quarter on quarter. Um, how many listed entities get rewarded by the market to go through years and years of burning capital and reporting huge losses and getting high valuations. So the listed space has a certain set of expectations which is different from the unlisted space which is where most of these startups are. But I guess, I guess trust also would probably come into that. And, and as choices are increasing, complexity is increasing, uh, one of the major concerns that I'm sure companies have is how do you make sure that customer security is kept, you know, at, uh, uh, right at the forefront, uh, that, you know, uh, payment details, personal information, all of that is not compromised in any way. That becomes a very important part of, of what I guess companies have to do. That is a very important part. And, you know, our new uh, data protection bill is in the process of getting finalized that will set the roadmap as well. Trust, as you said, is predominant in this business. It doesn't matter uh, much if you are taking a short term loan to buy a television or if you are, uh, for example, spending a thousand rupees to protect uh, the screen of your mobile phone through a insurance product. But the minute uh, somebody is giving them a significant part of their life's earnings, to protect their life after them or to manage their investments or take a loan for their house which requires a longer term relationship um, or to MSMEs for example where uh, access to capital is all the difference between uh, life and death and not just a question of growth. Uh, trust plays a very important role and trust means going beyond what regulation requires you to do. Uh, trust is about being transparent and honest in what you're doing with them. Trust is about understanding your customers so that you can be there for them when they need you. And that's where data plays a very important role. Uh, as against the past decades where 
the branch manager built a relationship with the customer and that's how he judged um, customer's uh, risk ability and what or how much of a loan he could give him. Today data can do that for you and that's why access to the right data with customer uh, consent becomes key in ensuring that you can choose the better customers, you can give them a better price loans or uh, an insurance product which is uh, customized to their requirements rather than just a blanket plain vanilla product for everyone. Now there's a, there's a very important aspect over here on data privacy and protection, both are very important or for protection, uh, while the government will lay out a set of protocols and policies which will have to be followed, but I think those companies that will go beyond that with a higher set of safeguards will continue to earn greater trust. Right, so you've spoken about the future of financial services. If I, you know, coming back to the crystal ball, what do you think is the future of digital currency? Obviously, there's been so much talk about that in recent months. What do you, what do you think is the future? Vikram, to me, this is uh, actually a little bit of a... Um, wait and watch situation. You have to keep in mind that when you look at currencies, your normal physical currencies, as you know, are all controlled by governments. That's what, And that creates a certain amount of trust. However, after the US dollar, the peg with gold was removed uh, many decades ago, it has become quite complex when you think about how our own currencies are getting valued. Why is the rupee 75 one day to the dollar? Why is it 73 the other day? Now, the only thing going for us is we trust that currency. I mean, we, we trust the people behind uh, who control the currency. On the other hand, when you look at how money moves around the world, you look at India, we've been one of the world's largest recipient of remittances. These still carry very high structural fees fund transfer processing time and all of this has not evolved with the digital world um, over the past uh, even I would say 10, 15, 20 years and that's where digital currency has made inroads. Forget the dark web and the wrong use of digital currency or cryptocurrency, I'm not talking about that. But even if you were to you just think of for the, all the correct reasons, you're, you're firstly creating a new method to value. And that's using blockchain as a technology and I'm not an expert there. So you naturally need central banks to develop trust and know how the underlying uh, uh, algorithms work. Second is in terms of usage in a digital world today, for example, look at India. We are so much ahead of the West in how we are using digital payments. It has changed our life in the last couple of years. Digital currency can take you to the next level. Now digital currency can also be your own sovereign currency but in a digital uh, avatar. And as we know, RBI is working on, on this. So we have to see what they come out with. So to me, clearly, there is a very strong need and a role for digital currency. Should it be a currency controlled by central banks because that's what allows trust? Should it be linked to some kind of a crypto formula, which, again, we have to build trust on? And for those that are experts in blockchain, tell us that it is trustworthy. But, but just if I have to be critical of it, uh, and not because I'm critical of the whole concept, but just as an example, look at some of these uh, uh, digital currencies, look at Bitcoin, look at Ethereum, look at how volatile that currency has been in the last few years and even the last 12 months. That does make you nervous as an individual holding that currency. Because everybody is not in it just uh, for the gamble. Uh, for most people, it will be to preserve value and to see value increasing based on an underlying set of assets or formulae or what be it. So I think this is an interesting evolution. It should be monitored. It should be used in the right manner. And we will hear more in the coming years. Okay, a couple of brief questions to just end up with. So, number one, of course, a lot of people are wondering about the future of work and the return to office plan and is it going to be hybrid? So, very quickly, what would be your thoughts on that? So, very quickly, uh, we've already identified uh, roles which can happen from home and uh, so whether it's call centers, whether it's a whole bunch of ops processes, uh, those are already happening from home. 
we've also op uh, identified opportunities where people need to work together they need to brainstorm they need to walk the corridors they need to leverage each other's ideas and uh, that needs to happen physically there, there is a lot that's already happened in the last uh, year or so there is fine tuning that will happen in the coming months all right mr bajaj well thank you so much for joining us and sharing your thoughts on what the future actually holds for us thank you so much thank you